I hope you enjoyed the, the, the opportunity to have some uh, lovely food, to have a little rest, uh, refreshment, um, but also to make some new, new connections and have some conversations. Thank you for being with us for our afternoon programme. We still have lots of exciting um, items on our agenda. And first of all, I am delighted to introduce my, my own colleague, Professor James Self, Professor of Physiotherapy. You've seen his name in the programme, maybe some of you are already familiar with his work, but we're very proud to say that James is only the second physiotherapist in the world to receive a higher doctoral award. So that's a recognition of his uh, vast publication um, repertoire, his encyclopedia of papers. But it's really important to follow on the theme that we had this morning about how we can, in partnerships with our different stakeholders, with our clients, service users and patients, and other political and commercial stakeholders, how we can produce research which has value and meaning. But the other very essential aspect is how we implement that in practice. And we need to do that in partnership as well. And we need to learn a lot of lessons still which are transferable across all our disciplines for how we get this uh, research to change practice. And we can only do that through partnership working as well. So, James, I'm delighted to introduce you and we look forward to listening to you and then hopefully having some comments and questions as well. Okay. Thank you very much, Angel. Yes, uh, it's interesting always having the after lunch spot to try and keep everybody awake while they're digesting, so uh, here it goes. Uh, I think Hazel was absolutely right that, um, in terms of, yes, I might have an encyclopedic uh, output of publications, but very few of them, if any, are sole author publications. They're all done in collaboration with various groups of people. Um, so it's really important that you can't underestimate or undersell the collaboration. Uh, and hopefully in this presentation, you'll see elements of uh, the first two presentations coming through uh, that fed into this kind of work. And in terms of the uh, last presentation this morning, this work sits very much at the front end of that framework, in the very exploratory beginning end of that framework. So that gives you some context of where it's coming from. Now let's see, uh, hopefully, I won't put this in my mouth and it's going to run right back. There we go. Uh, yes, right, well, we've already had enough of that. So, what are we going to talk about today? So, today we're focusing on serious spinal pathology. Uh, so, I'm just going to give some of you uh, who might not know particularly what serious spinal pathology actually is, a bit of background. Then, I'll talk about the actual collaborations that we've done investigating this particular topic. And then one of the key elements that's emerged from that collaboration, one of the key themes, is around communication and how communication should be optimised to uh, address patient outcomes when it comes to a topic such as serious spinal pathology. Uh, and finally, we've got a few solutions that we've come up with over the years um, for uh, practitioners and for patients in terms of resource materials that they can draw on, some of which I've brought with me today. And then I'll sum up with a couple of take-home messages, one sort of clinical take-home message and a kind of research take-home message. So you can kind of keep track of whether I'm roughly on time or not. So, serious spinal pathology. So to start off with, we all know that low back pain is a very common problem internationally. Okay? Um, there was a report published in The Lancet last year using data from uh, a couple of years ago. But you can see that in terms of global disability, back pain is right at the top of the tree. 57.6 million years lost uh, due to disability across 195 countries. And I think there's only 198 countries. So basically, every country in the world, there are millions and millions of people with low back pain. One of the challenges that you have as a frontline clinician, whether you're a GP or a physiotherapist or an osteopath or a chiropractor, is that for most people, it's not actually possible to identify a specific cause for the back pain. You can't put your finger on it and say, oh, it's this structure or it's that structure. And it's quite vague in a lot of people. So, we have a vast population of people turning up complaining of back pain, with a very, very small number of those will have something very significant and very seriously wrong with them. So what we have is a huge haystack, and we're looking for a really, really tiny needle. Okay? And it's, but it's really important that we find that tiny needle. 
And the whole program of work that I'm describing is around how we actually try and identify that one needle in this vast case study. Okay? I have to say this is one of my favourite slides. I sometimes threaten my wife, I love this tattoo. <laughs> Unless you don't stop giving me a hard time, I'm going to come home one day and I'm going to have that tattoo. Okay. Um, fantastic image, I love it. But anyway, let's not get distracted. Uh, so, serospinal pathology, there's a number of different categories. So, there's inflammatory, there's metabolic, there's infected. And the two that we're going to focus on this afternoon are the neoplastic, which are the cancers, and the mechanical, which usually relate to uh, lumbar spinal discs. Uh, so, we'll talk about those and you can remember that picture for a long time afterwards. Okay. So, this, the cancer, the metastatic spinal cord compression, usually occurs when there's a pathological vertebral body collapse, or sometimes the tumour itself actually impinges and presses against the spinal cord directly. The effect that that can have is not only to produce severe pain, that's usually why people turn up in physiotherapy or in the GP surgery, but as it progresses, and it can progress very, very quickly, uh, it can lead to paraplegia, it can lead to quadriplegia, and it can also lead to double incontinence. Okay? So these are very significant consequences of this particular condition, which often starts as what appears to be fairly simple, benign, straightforward back pain. Okay? Now, one of the key challenges here is this first book point is that. It's been documented uh, regularly across the literature that patients will typically present to GPs or physios who are non-specialists particularly within three weeks of the onset of back pain. So normally if somebody gets back pain and it's really bothering them, within about three weeks they'll go and see the GP. Now one of the key questions that most people are going to be asked when they go and see the GP is have you had cancer previously? Have you got any diagnosis of cancer? Because okay. that's a very strong indicator that you might possibly have a recurrence. But in nearly 25% of people that turn up uh, in GP surgeries, nearly 25% of them, they haven't had an initial cancer diagnosis. And this is the first sign that they actually have cancer. So they're coming to a GP with low back pain, no other symptoms, and this is the first time it's actually recorded that they might have the cancer. So you can see it's quite a serious issue that if you don't spot this early on, it can cause or lead to quite a lot of problems. The other um, issue I'm going to talk about this afternoon is the mechanical one, which is the chordic climate syndrome. This usually occurs when a, a large disc, usually the L4, L5 uh, lumbar disc, really massively ruptures or massively herniates and presses into the chordic climate. And those of you that are, remember anatomy, if I can Oh, oh dear, oops, there we go. Uh, so the, corner, the, the spinal cord ends round about um, L3, and then the rest of it just fans out like a horse's tail, hence the term cord equina. And basically, if you get a large disc that presses against that, it can lead to permanent loss of bowel and bladder control, it can lead to sexual dysfunction, and it can also lead to paralysis. So again, you can see that the consequences of this particular condition are quite significant. And similar to NSCC, it can start off relatively benignly, but then very quickly uh, change. So the scenario can change very rapidly from one where it doesn't seem as if it's too much of a problem to causing quite major problems for the patient. And then just to introduce a second element to this is this current recommendation from the British Association of Spinal Surgeons is that nothing's to be gained by delaying surgery. Basically, these people need surgery very, very quickly. So it's the same with MSCC. The intervention needs to be quick. Same with chronic equinus syndrome. The surgical procedure needs to be quick. So we have a responsibility as practitioners that if we spot these things, or if we're suspicious that a patient might have these things, we've got to get on with it. And we've got to know what to do and how to do it quickly. So we know that the best outcomes for our patients come with their diagnosis. They can turn up anywhere within the health system with all sorts of really wonderful signs and symptoms. We know that they need an urgent diagnosis and we know that they need a very rapid referral to a specialist centre. So how can we do this? So in clinical practice we use a system called red flags. There's lots of other colours, there's orange, black, blue, I won't bore you with all of those. The ones we're interested in today are the red flags and these are the ones 
that are possible indicators of serious spinal pathology. Now, you can see in the second bullet point that one of the problems is this is loads of these. There's loads and loads of red flags. Okay? There's a lot of red flags that you can take from the subjective examination when you're talking to the patient, and there's a smaller number that you can take from the objective examination when you're doing the uh, physical examination of the patient. Okay? So we've got this very confusing landscape and what we've tried to do over the last few years is try and narrow that down. So one of the key interesting red flags that might help alert a first line practitioner to one of these serious conditions that needs very rapid management. So, what are the consequences? Well, we've already seen the consequences in terms of the person, in terms of bladder, bowel, sexual dysfunction, paralysis, and all of those kinds of things, which are very significant. But in terms of the financial consequences and the societal consequences, they're also very large. So you can see that if uh, they have settled all of the claims in 2004 uh, for medical negligence relating to sort of red flag type issues or serious spinal pathology, it would have been about 13% of the NHS budget, which is a massive, massive slice. You can see the average compensation for a case for CES is over £300,000 in the UK and over half a million US dollars. I didn't have any figures for uh, euros, I'm afraid. So if anyone can tell me that later, I'd be very, very, I'd like to add that in. Nice. Um, the highest settlement for a single case of called equinus syndrome in the UK uh, in that five year period was over £2 million. Pounds. £2 million pounds cost to society. Um, and like I say, you can imagine what kind of problems the individual who was on the receiving end that claim uh, must have had in order to get such a high pair. So, this is serious stuff. Great for after lunch, isn't it? <laughs> Hope this is really helping with your digestion. <laughs> Excellent. Right, so, in summary, we've got rare conditions. We're looking for a legal in a huge haystack. It's a very confusing clinical picture, loads of red flags, and there are big, big problems if you miss it. Great, just what you need. Right, so how have we gone about this? Well, the key thing is collaboration. And I've developed a collaboration with one particular person uh, that's formed the, the centre of all of this, and then we formed multiple collaborations over the years. So in terms of the, the first key collaboration, uh, this is with uh, my colleague, uh, Sue Greenwich. And this all came about through opportunism. Uh, I happen to be the module leader for a, a third year physiotherapy module university many years ago that was called advanced orthopedics and the way it ran was we used to invite guest lectures in to deliver the material. So through a series of conversations I happened to end up getting in touch with Sue and saying would you like to come over and do a guest lecture? Uh, and she said yeah okay. And so she did a guest lecture on serious spinal pathology on some case studies. At the end of the lecture I was really blown away because I sat in on it because uh, I'd only recently left clinical practice and thought it could be interesting. And it was, it was really interesting. And I said to Sue, hey, God, this is really good stuff, you, we should write this up and let other people know about it. So it comes back to this dissemination uh, issue that we, uh, we were talking about before lunch. And she's oh yeah, yeah, okay. And a year later, I rang her up again, oh, Sue, would you like to come and repeat that lecture? She said, oh yeah. And at the end of it, I said, well, actually, you haven't written any of this up yet, have you? She said, okay, well, I will, but on condition that you help me. So I said, okay, fair enough. So off we went over to uh, where she was working and one morning we wrote a paper, this was the paper, it got published and that's really the paper that's kind of launched a, a thousand ships as it were. So from that one uh, seed we've then generated a, a lot of uh, work. But what struck me from that very first conversation and what has echoed all the way through this work over the years is that this expert knowledge tends to be hidden in silos. So lots of people have got lots of insights into this type of problem, but they're all looking at it from different perspectives, and they're not all talking to each other. And so it's really important, and it really emphasizes the idea of collaboration. And working across boundaries to share expertise is so important, where people that are specialists in one area can then help to inform specialists in another area. And improve practice, and ultimately, the key bit is improve outcomes for patients, because that's what it's all about. So, in terms of our collaborations, we've worked with the Greater Manchester and Cheshire Cancer Network, so that's specifically working with orthopaedic surgeons and GPs with special interests in oncology. So their view of a patient with cancer
cancer or their view of a patient with Cordocola syndrome is from one particular perspective in one particular part of that patient's journey. So we've got very valuable information from that. And similarly, we've tried to replicate that with other organisations. So particularly Christmas NHS Foundation Trust, which is a European cancer centre, talking to the oncologists, the palliative care specialists, the physios there. Similarly, with uh, extended scope physios working in general hospitals and working in hospices with oncologists and palliative care nurses. Each of these people have got specialist knowledge which tends to be restricted to that area and we've mined that knowledge, as it were, to then inform uh, a wider, wider group of people. The key question though, and I think uh, we've already had this answered by the, certainly the first two presentations, who are the real experts when it comes to these kinds of conditions? Because what we really want to understand is what symptoms the patients actually suffer from so that we can actually look for them when we're asking patients about them. What's the patient's understanding of those symptoms so that we can have some empathy in terms of when we ask the questions? And particularly that leads into the patient's experience of divulging this very sensitive uh, personal information. So none of us really like to be sitting there with a, a, a light in our eyes and being asked about our bowel, bowel habits or our bladder habits or our sexual function. It's not sort of thing you do on a Tuesday afternoon in general. Lunch. But that's effectively what we're interested in. How would it be easier or better for patients to talk about those kinds of things with health professionals? So, especially when we consider that the management of these conditions is often time critical and they have first hand knowledge of what's happening and how things are changing, so we need to empower the patients to uh, take control. So, in order to do all of those things, we engage in multiple qualitative methods. Um, so with the general public, we've done experience-based design projects where we have a London taxi cab outside the health centre with a video camera in it and the patients have got inside the, uh, the, um, the taxi and then they've recorded um, answers to questions about their experiences of um, health problems. So we've used those kind of data. We've done lots of individual in-depth uh, patient interviews, particularly with corded aquinas sufferers what was it like for you? We've done focus groups with physiotherapists. Again, when you're talking to patients about these kinds of sexual dysfunction issues, how does that go? What do you find challenging about those conversations? We've used nominal group techniques, which I know Hazel's quite a big fan of, uh, with our hospice and palliative care specialists. And that was quite interesting, where you had a group of very different individuals, ranging from the, the head consultant to junior nurse, and in terms of the sort of power differential within that group, a normal group technique really helps to cut away all of that. And so even everybody has their own voice, so that was quite a nice technique to use. We've used a lot of consensus meetings and peer review of the material, and we've done a lot of audit work going through tracing what's happened to patients, um, working backwards in terms of their patient journey. So all of that has been kind of triangulated and synthesized. And one of the key things that's come up this over and over and over and over again is around communication. Okay? So, um, this is actually a quote from a real patient. Okay? Uh, it's not a quote from the gentleman in the photograph. Okay? And what this really highlights is that this was a lady who had a massive disc prolapse and she then had a cordial client problem which has left her with permanent uh, disability. And she recalls at the time that her husband rang the ambulance man. The paramedic came into the kitchen. She was rolling around on the floor in agony. And the paramedic asked the right question. Have you been able to have a wee? Can you wee? And she just thought, what a ridiculous question. I'm rolling around on the floor. Why would I want a wee in my kitchen? I'm in agony. This is a ridiculous question. Okay. So it's the right question, but it's framed incorrectly. The communication strategy was incorrect. Okay? And so one of the key messages is in the presence of this catastrophic pain, a lot of these questions that we are actually quite interested in as practitioners, for safety points of view, are actually appear quite stupid and quite irrelevant. Okay? So we really need to think about asking the right questions, but also in the right way. And we need to empower our patients to understand their condition so that they understand why we're asking what appears to be quite abstract questions. Okay? And they, they can respond appropriately during the consultation. Okay? 
So most patients don't know what they don't know. And why would you? You know, why would you connect the fact that you've got some sort of uh, bladder problem or bowel problem with the fact you've got raging back pain? It's not something that naturally connects with people. So the patients, when you ask them these kinds of questions, don't really understand why you're asking them. And so they don't really buy into why you're asking them and give you comprehensive answers. Okay? Certainly most patients don't realise that these questions are related to issues which could be life-changing. Okay? A lot of these things are non-reversible. Once you've got bladder problems, once you've got paraphilia, they don't come back yet. It is a life-changing situation. And one of the things that we found from some of our own work that was interesting was that when you look to the physiotherapy records or the GP records, there was clear documentary evidence that these questions had actually been posed to the patients. When you went and asked the patients, did anybody ever ask you these questions? They said, oh, no, no, I don't remember that. And we think that that's a sort of filtering effect of the pain. They don't actually remember the fact that they've been asked these questions. So again, framing the question and making it uh, important in the person's brain is really important. So communication of the gravity of the red flag questions is key. So you need to really frame the questions. I'm now going to ask you some really important questions. They might seem a bit odd. They might not seem relevant to you, but from a physiotherapy point of view or from a GP perspective, these are really important questions and I really need to know the answers to these. Okay. So it's that kind of thing which helps to focus the patient's thinking. The other thing is about the actual use of language itself. Um, and you've got to use a very explicit language which is understood by the patients. I mean, as healthcare practitioners, we tend to be quite polite people, most of us. Um, but, and we sort of phrase it as sort of polite, medico kind of way. And I think this is a great quote from one of the patients. If I'd been told numbness was around my back passing or my genitals, that would have been much better. Everyone I saw that was medically trained said, have oh, you got uh, saddle numbness? So saddle numbness to most patients is kind of a bit odd. Um, and those patients that do understand what saddle numbness might be tend to think of a bicycle saddle. But actually, what we're talking about from a medical perspective is a horse saddle. So it's a much, much bigger area than most people think it is. Okay. Um, and if you try and Google that in your consultations and show patients, you tend to get into trouble for that. So you can be careful with this. <clears throat> right. So you've got to empower the patient because time to surgical opinion is paramount. So you've got to give them the information of what symptoms to look for and what to do about future health symptoms. So they need to know what to do and how quickly to do it. So, that's kind of the work that we did. What solutions did we come up with to try and help the patients and try and help the therapists with all of this? So, the first thing we did was we came up with these, which are the MSCC credit cards. And there are some examples of these over there on the table, which you can open. You know, here's a life-size version. Thank you. My glamorous assistant uh, has a life-size version there. Uh, there's a few you can take away with you over there. Um, so basically what this does, this is a thing that the therapist or the GP, uh, whoever's seen the patient at the time, can give to the patient and talk through with them. Okay? And so one of the things that we decided to do with this was try and use this red flag mnemonic to try and help uh, the therapist to remember which questions it was that they needed to ask. And the key thing about this is that because the patient can take it away, if some one or other of these things starts to change or starts to develop, they can take this with them to future consultations and say, look, I was given this and I was told if any of these things happened, I had to come urgently, okay? And so patients are taken a lot more seriously when they turn up in uh, accident and emergency units when they have this with them. It really helps to empower them with their future um, consultations. So, the idea for these actually came from patients themselves. It wasn't our idea that we were sat around as a group of academics or a group of clinicians. It was very much a patient-generated idea. One of the questions that we're often asked is, well, does it actually make any difference? Well, it's hard to always quantify, does it make any difference? But what we can tell you is that a government report, which was this quick toolkit, said that the cost of circulating 9,000 of these cards, which would have been about 800 pounds, would be far outweighed by the cost saved if even one case of MSCC was diagnosed early or prevented. 
So we thought that was quite a strong endorsement because that's come from the government and publication. And what we found is that a number of different organisations have actually taken it upon themselves to print them uh, using their own logos. And to our knowledge, we know that about at least half a million of these have been printed and distributed throughout the UK. It was nominated for a national award, which was the Patient Safety Awards in 2012, and we became finalists, uh, but we didn't actually win. I felt a bit like Cinderella, really. I got dressed up in the posh frock, and we did win. But hey, at least we got to the party, so that was amazing. So, what I'm trying to say is that there does seem to be some evidence that it is making a difference in the real world of practice. When it comes to call it a climate, we've done a very, very similar kind of thing where we've developed a clinician's cue card. So this is a much bigger sort of A4 size thing which we laminate. Um, so that is an example of the cue card there. Um, and what that does is it really helps the therapists because the therapists find asking some of these questions that are on this list really quite challenging. It's a bit embarrassing asking the patients, you know, people you've never met before, first time you've ever seen them and you're asking them, do you have trouble uh, when you pass your, do you uh, know when your bladder is full or empty? These are the kind of tea time kind of questions that most people are used to asking. So by having a cue card, it helps because you can kind of, oops, uh, you can kind of hold it and then almost hide behind it, but then you can actually read it. Right, uh, so it helps the therapists keep on track, so that's very good. And we've also basically <coughs> produced a similar version um, in terms of a, a credit card size thing again, but for the call it climate. And again, the question is, is this successful? Well, one of our colleagues from um, a different part of the UK uh, saw this and thought it was a, a really neat idea. And so what she's done with her NHS Trust, um, which has a very multicultural population, is they've actually translated this card into 28 separate languages and they've now got a website where you can actually download these uh, for free. Uh, so that's all the information you need there. And look, <laughs> no, not by coincidence, <laughs> oh, it's getting exciting. Get ready. <laughs> now I'm not going to read that to you. Look at that. I'll let you read that for a second. I'm not going to attempt to say anything. I hope it makes sense. <laughs> I'm getting some not, so it must be okay. Good. So the, the translation process must be reasonably good. So that's the reverse side, and that's the front side. We did have some feedback from um, an Italian person that said that the Italian one was a bit not quite right, so they've corrected it, and it, apparently the Italian one I'll allow you, you guys to say whether that's good or bad. But there you go. So that's a, a, an example of where we've helped uh, beyond uh, the immediate group of patients, trying to help a large set of patients. So uh, I'm getting quite near the end now. Uh, so the key clinical take home message is that there's a massive uh, range of potential signs and symptoms for serious spinal pathology. Patients themselves, and why would they, don't recognise the importance of the red flag questions. So it's really important to frame your questions uh, before you ask them. Um, if you are working with this group of patients, there should always be a very low threshold to send them for further investigation. And if you're in doubt, just send them on to someone else uh, that's got the expertise to deal with them. Because that's not what we should be doing as a faculty. And in terms of the key research take home messages, uh, it's really important that we've learned that there's so much really good information but it's contained in these professional silos and you need to collaborate to mine out that information. The patients themselves hold an awful lot of information. You need to get that information from the people. And unless you collaborate, uh, you're not really going to get very far. And ultimately, the patients are the experts in this field. Okay. I think that's the bad thing. That is it. Yes. Thank you, James, but don't go away because we do have time for questions.
Can I invite any questions or comments from members of the audience? Yes, certainly. Thank you, Delia. Very, very interesting talk. I'm uh, a physiotherapist from the Hochschule and I'm rushing out of this talk because I'm now going into the practice treating some patients mainly with back. Take what lives with you. Don't leave my work. No, 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 I won't. Um, my question is um, whether we could also, whether you could also say something about uh, looking at this problem the other way around because um, mainly we have an opposite situation that. We are asking this question, we are very much aware of the um, severeness of this problem and in most cases when patients are referred to us, they are um, not suffering from these problems. So the problem with these red flags always is that they might be um, wrongly interpreted or overestimated or whatever and then the um, communications, the communication about pain and the severeness of these um, symptoms must be very carefully conducted so not to threaten the patients. So do you, with this important um, way of dealing with red flags, have you also um, spoken within the team about to tackle the other way around, how to, to um, communicate the situation that it is not such a serious spinal pathology and in most cases it isn't such a serious problem. Yeah. Thank you very much, that's a really good question. So yeah, because this is, as I said at the beginning, it's quite scary stuff and so what you don't want to do is 99.9% .9 of patients scare them to death. Okay? So it's, it's quite a, a thin line to tread. So, Basically, it's almost like having a kind of triage system in your brain, whereby you think, yeah, it's really, really unlikely that this person has got any of these things. That there's nothing here that's making me a bit worried. I'm fairly comfortable with all this. I'll ask some fairly high-level, broad screening questions. Okay, so you might still say, now I'm going to ask you some quite um, personal questions now. They might seem a bit irrelevant to your back pain, but these are screening questions I just need to ask you just to check everything's okay. So you might ask them a general question about the bladder, you might ask them a general question about the bowel. Chances are they're going to say, yeah, everything's fine. Okay, move on. Okay, Don't worry about it. Then you've got a, a second group of patients whereby you think, hmm, I'm not sure about this. I can't quite put a finger on this, but there's something I'm not happy about here. So, uh, I'm now going to ask you some questions. Uh, they feel a bit odd questions, you might not think they're relevant, but I really need to ask these questions. Oh yeah, well, I have this thing with my bladder. Oh, right, how do you know? Okay, right, well, I'm going to ask you a few more questions about your bladder. And then you go into a much more detailed question. Okay? And so those are the sort of amber patients where you think, right, okay. And at the end of that, it might be one way or the other. You think, mm, well, on balance, they still seem okay, but I'm not sure. And then there might be a few others who think, oh no, we definitely prefer these. So on the ones where you're sort of still kind of mm, not quite sure, what we talk about in the UK is a thing called watchful wait. So basically, you tell the patient, say, right, okay, you've given me this information, this is quite interesting. The way you are at the minute suggests that everything is okay, but what I want us to do is go away with one of these cards, and if any of these things happen, then get on the phone, go to Accident Emergency, do whatever, you then act. So what you're doing is you're kind of sending the patient away, empowered, so that they know what it is they're looking for, okay? And if that happens, then they can act, okay? And then the third group of patients is that Oh my goodness, don't move. Help! Help! You know, and um, our, our new book, which is coming out next year, 
is actually called red flags and blue lights because there are occasions where you need to get on the phone and get an ambulance to that patient there and then, and that's hence the concern of blue lights. So we've only got three conditions that we're going to talk about in the new book. Cornequina syndrome, NSCC, and uh, osteoporosis. Okay, and we've put osteoporosis in in a kind of politically challenging kind of way, rather than it necessarily being in a, an immediate emergency. But certainly with the NSCC and the CDS uh, patients, my colleague Sue regularly has to dial 999 and get an ambulance in the patient because uh, they're in such distress. And it clearly an impending catastrophe. So she doesn't touch that, she just goes away to 999. Thank you very much. I'll take this then to our practice. Okay. <coughs> James referred Sorry. to red flags, blue lights. Mm -hmm. Do your ambulances have blue lights? Yeah. Just, just checking. <laughs> <laughs> so, so which flashing lights have that? Well, it's the road works. That is isn't good. It's not an emergency. Oh, it could be if you're tied to the person. Do we have another question? Christian Teal. Yeah, thanks. Yeah. Christian Teal from Hawthorne. From Hello, Christian. Um, <laughs> nice to meet you. <laughs> um, just to follow up on, on Katia's question, have you got any um, evidence about the number of false positives that you might generate by um, kind of making people more um, sensitive uh, about possible serious consequences? Uh, the short answer is no. We don't have any numbers. I mean, one of the, one of the difficulties of this is that for if there's a data in the UK that says for a normal general practitioner, one of these might be a once in a lifetime or once in a career event. So how common these are depends on where you are in the patient's journey. So what's happened is that a lot of physiotherapists have moved very much upstream in terms of the patient's journey and are seeing patients really, really early on. Whereas in the past, patients would have seen a GP, they'd have seen an orthopedic Solves and months and months would have gone past before they ever turned up in a physiotherapist. That's really changed in the UK. Um, so when it comes to asking about false positives and the kind of numbers associated with it, it depends on where you are. So if you were in an accident in an emergency, you would have one set of numbers. If you're in a general practitioner, you'd have a very different set of numbers. So it's a very difficult thing to actually collect data on. Um, one of the things that does cause a lot of issue in the UK is that one of the guidelines, particularly for chordic quinus syndrome, is that patients should be having an MR scan very, very rapidly. And I think the thing is, I can't remember the, the deadline, but it's either 12 hours or 24 hours or something like that. It's a very rapid thing that you've got to have it done. Um, and so what happens is that there's a lot of monitoring of referral rates for MR scans. And so what people get very upset about it is over referral because an MR scan is actually very expensive. So it's costing a lot of money to basically scan a lot of people who are absolutely negative. But a lot of the information coming through from people like the British Association of Spinal Surgeons that are kind of on the, the other side of the scan, as it were, is that actually we really, really need these scans, but it doesn't matter how much it costs. So there's a big debate going on that the radiology departments are kind of saying, this is ridiculous, we're having to scan loads and loads of people to look for that needle in the haystack, and the rates are too high. But then the surgeons are saying, actually, you need really, really high rates to find the needles so that we can operate in a timely fashion. So there's quite a, a tension between those two states. Uh, and it's often physics get caught up in the middle of all of that, because it's often physics they are referring into these systems, and so it's the physics that get into trouble, of course. Ooh. <laughs> okay, we have time for one final comment or question. Excellent. Oh. <laughs> I thought I was going to get a couple of there. Sorry, there's no one else. I um, have okay, another question. If you're here in Germany and you're a physiotherapist, you have to say the word direct access or first practitioner contact, otherwise you're not a good, uh, um, in the, at least not, not in the um, academic part. Have you had any experience 
um, whether there's differences in professions and how they approach um, that um, yeah, sensitization of the, the, the patient, how they deal with the red flags, etc. Um, from yeah, general practitioners to specialists to physical therapists. Again, the short sure. answer is no. Um, again, what you find is that there's sort of, if you like, theoretical and philosophical debate. So people like Martin Underwood, who's a professor of general practice in Birmingham, he's a very, he's written quite a few papers that are very anti-red flags as a concept. And he says that you need a much more sophisticated type of approach and a much more holistic individual sort of approach. Then you've got people like um, Aaron Downey from Australia, who's a chiropractor. And he's very much looking at red flags from a different perspective, where he's talking about sensitivity and specificity and the way that you would have a diagnostic test. Um, and we've always argued from our perspective that we've never really thought of red flags as diagnostic tests in that sense. And we always think of them as clinical signposts. And it's that very much so, well, I'm not quite sure about this, or well, I can't quite put the finger on it. And that doesn't really lend itself to sensitivity and specificity type testing. Um, so we've kind of always argued against that kind of thing. Uh, then there's Chad Cook in the States, and he's very much uh, sort of in between in a way, but he sides a bit more with Martin Underwood in terms of what actually red flags a bit of a crap idea. Um, but what we should be doing is much more that watchful way. So we, oh, we can't quite put the finger on what's wrong with this patient. Go away, come back in three days' time, and I'll see what's, what's changed. So he's kind of got a watchful way type of approach. And I think he had a, a paper last year that was saying something about get rid of red flags, bring in watchful way, something like that. So it's not a universally accepted concept. But the way we think of it is very much, um, we had a, an editorial in, a couple of weeks ago, it was about called Aquino. And we just tried to paint the scenario that actually it's three in the afternoon, you're a physio in the clinic, it's your 15th patient of the day, you've got 10 minutes, okay, this patient might have one of these conditions, all right? And what you're not interested in is sensitivity and specificity testing. What you are interested in is thinking, oh, I'm not sure about this, I think I better prefer it. And we try to, that's how we think of red flags. It's very much a clinical, gut feeling type of signpost rather than a very scientific. And you can see that the way we've approached investigating it has all been at that very exploratory end of the NRC framework. We're never going to get to do an RCT or some sort of control trial looking at any of this. We're always going to be at that very messy, ugly landscape end of it to try and understand it. So, did that answer your question? I suddenly realised I was rambling then. Is that what the professor did? Oh, yeah, I'm good. I was doing my job properly, Mark. Do I have to turn this off now? I'm quite enjoying this. Well, thank you. We'll take this off you.